Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. We continue our series of webinars on a uh, less than regularly scheduled uh, programming these days. The weather has turned really beautiful. People are back to doing things uh, like two years ago. It's really weird. It feels like two years have just collapsed in somewhere. I'm not sure where they went. Um, and I'm back to teaching. So that kind of affects the schedule a bit because now I'm starting to travel. But we will continue to bring you great webinars because they're really fun and everybody loves them. And I really love learning from all these different people. So that said, today my guest is Anne-Marie. Oh, crap, I just forgot your last name. <laughs> the Hancock. Hancock, I was like, Anne-Marie, oh no. <laughs> it has been that kind of a month. I go by Anne-Marie instead of Dr. Hancock. <laughs> Dr. Anne-Marie Hancock, and she is actually from my backyard, which is really exciting, um, in Warrington, which is only about 30 miles away. And, um, and one of the cool things is that Dr. Joyce Harmon has sent some stuff to Dr. Hancock that I have worried and wondered where it went because I used to use it for teaching. And we've just found out that uh, Dr. Hancock has those things, which is really exciting so that I can um, borrow them once in a while when I need to. And I'm just thrilled to have you today. So thank you for joining me. Sure, thank you for having me. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today um, is a little bit in my own wheelhouse. Um, I specialize in body work and looking at the biomechanics of looking at how feet and teeth and saddle fit and nutrition and all these other things can you know connect into the whole horse um so that we're going to kind of start talking about that today and um we'll see how it goes and if you guys have questions pipe up and um, you know we'll just have a conversation about it and see what you um think um, i'm going to be back in a few weeks yes and um i was thinking if if we had some interest that I'd really like to talk about internal fascial restrictions and oh yeah, um, like how that affects the body and kind of focus on that next time. That was That'd kind of what I was thinking. Awesome. So That's before we go cool. into your PowerPoint, can you give us your, like, like, have you always been a horse crazy kid? You know, how did you wound <laughs> right. up? Where did you go to vet school? Right. Um, well, um, I'm originally from Northern California. So I grew up about 45 minutes east of San Francisco in the suburbs and, um, you know, rode when I could. And um, once we kind of got like towards high school age, um, I finally had some uh, an ability to actually ride more. So most of my riding started, you know, more daily in high school. And then after high school and pony club, I went to Colorado State. Um, so I was in Colorado for 10 years. I have a bachelor's degree in equine science. And then I have my master's in anatomy and neurobiology, and then my veterinary degree from Colorado State. Wow, um, and so, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I graduated from Colorado State in 2003 and um, moved to the East Coast. Um, my husband's from Virginia, so we wanted to be kind of close to family. So we spent 10 years in North Carolina and then 10 years up here now in Northern Virginia. And uh, I started doing acupuncture, I'm trying to think maybe five years after vet school. So like 15 years ago, and then started doing osteopathy in 2010. So I've been doing osteopathy as the major part of what I do in my practice for 12 years. So, um, you know, living up in this area in Northern Virginia, any of you guys who've been up here, we're so lucky because there are so many horses and so many people that, you know, ride all kinds of disciplines that um, you can stay really busy with a niche, you know, kind of specialty. So it's a really great place to learn something like osteopathy and practice because I can do it all day, every day. You yeah. Know, um, <laughs> when we I was have North quite Carolina, the dense horse that. population, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, it's great. It's just so fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, so I've been up here since 2013 and kind of specializing in the osteopathic bodywork realm and... I'm also doing some other routine medicine, but really trying to focus in on just the body, body work section of it. And it's really fun. <laughs> I love it. I'm just getting a few more people in on the webinar. Apparently there's uh, folks signing up after we started. So I'm just checking on that. If you wonder why I don't look like I'm looking at you. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, we got lots of interest today. Let's see. All right. So we've got one more person that we're going to Alex is working on and we're going to get that sorted out and um, we're moving we're going to move to a new system and I really hope to have have 
that completed this week, but of course I didn't. So we're still working on the old <laughs> system, which has its, has its um, moments. Let's just put That's it that right. way. Yeah. Um, anyway, all right, so let's dive right into your topic here. And um, I made you co-host so you can um, get to the screen. Can, all right, so I'm gonna share my screen and I'll put this up. Let's see how this works. All right, can you guys see that okay? Yep, and all right. yep, awesome. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about today is um, how you can maybe relate to how your horse is moving based on looking at teeth and feet, um, which are two things that I think a lot of people think they know a lot about, but maybe need to think about in a little different way than maybe they have been. Um, so I thought we could discuss that and see what you guys think. And um, like I said, stop me at any point if you have any questions. Yep, and I'll monitor the chat and the Q&A, and so I'll interrupt you on a regular basis if there's questions. Perfect. <laughs> that sounds great. I love that. Um, so this is just who I am. Like I, like I said, um, I have I own True North Equine Veterinary Practices up in Warrington, Virginia. Um, been here for about 10 years. We, you know, just really focus on trying to work on the whole horse, like really looking at where are the body problems and how does that relate to which organs are functioning well and which aren't, you know, what problems are things that we can fix with body work, which problems are things that we have to fix with chewing, what problems do we need to address with, you know, dentistry, which problems are saddle fit, which problems might be, you know, something that the rider has. You know, so when you start to see clients multiple times a year and you see a pattern, you know, and you're pretty confident that you're able to do your part, then you can start to pick out these other things and figure out what's going on. Um, so, you know, I think probably anyone who is listening, especially if they're using their surefoot pads, has seen this connection between, you know, the pole and the TMJ into the withers and the chest and then back into the pelvis and the sacrum and the lumbar, lumbar spine. So, you know, I like to think of it as, you know, my root really is the pelvis and the sacrum. So when I look at a horse, that's where I start is I want to know, you know, where is the motion in the sacrum? Do they have any restrictions? Because that's really where the rest of the angle of the spine is going to come from. So if they have a restriction in the pelvis and the sacrum, I'm absolutely going to see something that's going to create a problem for them with impulsion, you know, with holding their back up, they're going to maybe be irritated by saddle fit, you know, all those sorts of things. So I want to start there, look at it from front to back, side to side, you know, is it flexing and extending? Is it moving to the left? Is it moving to the right? You know, are there any trigger points? What's sore? Um, and then, you know, you build up from that. Um, I think that the longer I do this, the more I find myself focusing on the withers in the chest and the girth area. Um, I don't know if you find that, Wendy, but the rib you know, cage just, is an interesting thing in both riders and horses, I think. It's, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There's like so many things trying to cross and connect and, you know, nothing, it, it just doesn't work the way that you want it to a lot of times. So I think that um, I've gotten really good at adjusting fronts and back ends. And I think it's because you can get into them a little easier, whereas because of the rib cage, you're kind of restricted on how you get to things that are in the chest. Um, so it's taken me longer to figure that out. But I do think that a lot of stuff that we see, you know, that ends up being, let's say, a restriction in flexion at the pole, you know, or movement of the jaw, or their ability to really stretch their hind legs back and push off of them can be related to, you know, diaphragm and chest and sternal restrictions. You know, so that's why I think that's really key. And, and that's where the saddle and the rider are also creating their own disturbances and flow, you know, whether we want to or not, we all do. Um, and then going forward from that, I think that um, you almost have to think of the mandible itself as two separate legs. So, you know, the horse doesn't stand on four legs, you know, they balance on six legs. So they have their two hind limbs, their two forelimbs, and then the two um, wings of the mandible. So um, do you, can people see me or do they just see you? I can see you. I've I've got you in the little gallery on the side by side. Okay. So if okay, you just so I'm just gonna I just, yeah. Here we go. So if you guys can see, you know, this is what oh, here. the back of the mandible looks like. Can you guys see that? 
There we go. Okay. Okay. Do we, do we want to stop your screen share so they can see that better? Yeah, that's sure. That's a really good. Thank you. <laughs> it's like, how do I do this? Okay, there we go. So um, if you guys can see the two, this is a this is, you know, this is the lower jaw of a horse, right? So you can see that there's two separate TMJ joints here, right? Um, and I really do think we need to think of those as balance points for the horse. So, you know, if you think about yourself, even if you were to stand up and, you know, start to put all of your weight on one leg, like let's say you put it all on your right, you know, your right leg and you kind of tipped your hip over. As soon as you did that, you would notice that your shoulder and your jaw have to compensate you know, so that you still have a straight line in your horizon and your balance. So I think we still have to think about that with horses is that, yes, they're definitely using these as extra legs. So, and that's kind of the important part on there. Okay, so I'll go back to sharing my screen. I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, from current slides. Okay, so there we go. Yeah. Um, so I thought I'd start with the case and end with the case, and then we can talk about the pieces that I'm looking at, you know, in between. So we're going to start by looking at a horse named Hunter. And um, he is a 15 year old warm blood. You know, I've seen him multiple times. The first time I saw him, his um, pull was so out that he kind of held himself with his head twisted to the side and looked to the side. Um, and we were able to get the majority of that free, but I've just never been able to get it completely completely to go away. So, you know, we're looking at two or three years of doing body work. And when I see him, usually I have maybe, so for me, an average number of adjustments on a horse that I see multiple times a year would be say 10 to 15. And that's usually what I see on him. Whereas, you know, on a horse I've never seen before, it might be between 30 and 50, you know, pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to work out. Um, so, you know, let's say we have 10 to 15 things on him, but we're still having problems with this, you know, recurrent sort of beginning to twist in his pole and a little bit of head shaking behavior. And every time I go out, he still has this jaw restriction. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of dentists in our area and most of them are really good. And the person that did this horse is actually really good too. I think he's just been doing them without sedation. And I think that's one of the things that I think lay dentists are amazing. I love all of the lay dentists that we get in Virginia. But I think what sometimes gets them in trouble is when they're trying to work without veterinarians around and, and they're trying to do things without sedation. It's a lot harder to do incisors and get those balanced when you have a horse that's shaking his head all over the place. You know, it's just the way it is. So um, what I see on this horse um, is that this section on the bottom, his bottom right, is longer. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay. And then this section over here on the top is longer. So when I start to see that, I know that there's been a problem for at least six months to a year. And, you know, if he hadn't been floated in a year, this could be a year's worth of slant, you know, so that tells me that for a year, his, his mandibles have been out of balance and he's been chewing on one side you know, something like that. So this, this particular horse had been floated like the month before, right? So, you know, to me, that means, okay, he's either not able to correct this or it's been there the whole time and he's not worried about it. You know, there's still, you know, some people who think that if they have a slant, you should leave it. Um, I'm not one of those people, but there are people that believe that. Um, so, you know, for me, this is what's keeping my adjustment from holding right? So if you have a restriction in the mandible on one side and you have a slant that you can visibly see on the, you know, on the horse, so you're seeing some sort of, you know, asymmetry, then you know they're only chewing on one side. So that means that they're going to have muscle atrophy on one side and increased muscle structure on the other side of the pole. It's going to affect how they bend at the pole, which is then going to set them up for balance issues in the rest of their body. So um, I'm working with a friend right now that's the dentist, and we're trying to come up with a way to come up with correlations so that dentists could walk into a barn and look at horses that have slants and say, oh, I think that you need to look at, you know, a problem in the right front or the right hind, you know, just from being able to look at the teeth. So we can really start talking about this is a part of the problem. So this is what some of these cases were from is that 
So what we're finding is that if they have a problem in the jaw on the left, they will often have a problem with the left front leg being more upright and with the right hind. So, you know, just trying to look at that a little bit. So we're trying to correlate it all. So what you see here, like this part of the jaw that's taller is gonna keep him from being able to move his jaw to the left. Does that make sense to you guys? Yep. If he's trying to slide this lower jaw over, it's gonna get caught. So then what happens is he can move his lower jaw this direction, but not the other way. So I have a video later that shows, um, it's a great video of motion uh, of chewing. If you guys have seen it before, it's still a good review. So we'll go through that, but you know, that's what we're looking at here. So then we look at his teeth. So what I wanted you guys to see here, this angle right here, yeah, the incisor angle should actually be a little more upright. So he's a little, um, you know, too slanted this way. He should be more like this, more gradual. And then he actually had something really interesting on his um, molars as far as, you know, if you look at them, I don't think anyone would say that there are any sharp points in there. Do you guys all agree that his teeth look nice and smooth? Yep. You know, so we don't see anything sharp, but there should be an angle to the molars and how they connect. So what I've put in with these black lines is what that angle should be, right? So for the bottom, the inside edge should be taller than the outside edge. Okay. And what I see on both of these is so this edge should be taller than this edge. And so we actually have the opposite. You, are you guys able to kind of visualize that? It's hard because it's two dimensional. So instead of this angle and these lower teeth, you know, being higher on the inside and lower on the outside, it's actually higher on the outside and lower on the inside. Okay. And you can see that here too. So what that means is his ability to actually get full excursion and that nice motion with his jaw is gonna be really limited, right? So it's just gonna perpetuate the problem he has. So we changed that angle um, and made the incisors more even. Um, and then we're looking at his feet. So he has, he's being corrected right now. We're working with them to try to correct him and see what we can do to get him more even, but he's chronically had a problem with an upright left foot and a slanted right front foot. So it's harder to see because the fear is actually actively working on it, but um, that's what we're seeing here. So then I have a slow-mo picture. So, um, oh, I got this first. So this is my summary. So um, I use a device sometimes uh, called the lameness locator. Um, I think they've tried to change the name now. They like to call it equinosis. So it doesn't sound like we're diagnosing lameness, but what it does is it predicts asymmetries in the body. And it has, hold on one second, I'm just gonna step over here. I'll stop sharing my screen for yep. a minute just so you guys can see this. Okay, so what it has is it has these little tiny chips. Do you guys see how small this is? They're little tiny chips. And the, each one of these is all waterproofed and it has an accelerometer chip in it. And that chip will measure motion. So we can turn these on and use a Bluetooth device. And like, I have a little piece that sits on their head like this. And then we have one that sits on their sacrum and one that hits, sits on the, wraps around the right front leg. And so what you do is you put all those on and then you can trot them in a, in a straight line or on a circle. And it will try to predict to you where the asymmetries are. If it's a push off problem, if it's an impact problem in which leg. So it can't tell you that you have fetlock you know, arthritis, but it can tell you, hey, there's something going on in the right front leg and this horse doesn't want to put the leg down and bear weight on it. So then you kind of have some idea what you're looking for. So we were using that on him. So I'll share again. It's always going to make me go back. No, I won't uh, somebody's there. saying, cool. Lameness locator is really cool. I, I, and I'm sorry, that's the name I know it by. <laughs> I, you know, everybody calls it that. And then every time you talk to the people that own it, they're like, Equinosis. The Equinosis. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I got that it. That wasn't the original name. <laughs> Sorry, this one sticks. And we understand what it does, right? Right. You know, and I think they're just afraid that people are going to say that anytime there's an asymmetry, their horse is lame. And I think you just have to understand that it's a lot more sensitive than the eye. So a lot of what we see is just normal asymmetries in the body, just like most of us have, like, 
And, you know, if anybody's ever gotten on a treadmill and listened to yourself run, you usually have one leg that lands harder than the other. And it's not like we're saying we shouldn't move because we're lame. We're just a little asymmetrical in what we do. And I like to think about it that way when I'm doing these things where I'm looking for little asymmetries. So um, on this horse, we had a left hind push off lameness and a right hind impact lameness. So that means that he doesn't want to put his full weight on the right hind and he doesn't want to push off of the left hind. Um, and both front feet, when he goes, he doesn't want to land heel first. He kind of wants to just very slowly touch down with his front feet. So we saw that too. Um, and then we were talking and she was reminding me that he did have a right rear right hind suspensory injury. So I think that what we're seeing with this pattern is actually probably a pattern that's been in place for a long time, you know, along with that injury or because of the injury, something like that. So, um, and then on the other side, I have what we found in his body. So we had a problem with the left TMJ. So for me, that means that the TMJ isn't moving across midline and down. So it's being kind of held up close to the body. And then I usually find this pattern that I wrote down on all horses that have a TMJ problem. So I can kind of walk down the neck and find where the problems are based on where the jaw restriction is. And then we have the upright left front and the you know kind of long toe, low heel right front. And then a restriction in the left lumbar, which is why he's not pushing off of the left hind, right? His lumbar spine isn't able to flex as well. And the right SI is restricted. So I think that um, usually for me, when I'm looking at body restrictions, um, where I have, um, so for me, when I'm naming the SI restriction, it's a problem with the sacrum not lifting, not a problem with the sacrum being stuck up. So a lot of chiropractors will adjust down. I adjust up on the SI. So I'm trying to bring it into that flex so that the spine can flex with it. So I think um, that when I see a problem with the right SI, it's usually related to that left pelvis pulling everything kind of down on and to the midline. You know, so the SI is just adjusting with that. So I think that's a pretty normal pattern to see. So this is, um, I'm gonna turn off the sound because otherwise it sounds really weird because it's in slow-mo. So um, this is this horse walking and we're gonna start at like, I'm trying to think. We gotta get a little further, there we go. Let's see if you guys can see, uh, the main thing I see with him is he lands toe first. So um, I use a lot of slow-mo when I'm looking at horses to look at foot patterns. And can you guys see that, that he's landing? It's a little broken up, which is the problem with Zoom, but I think that um, okay. like the left front seems to not land quite as much toe first as the right front, is that correct? Right. Yeah, yeah, the right front really lands toe first. Yep. So um, for our area, we see this a lot. I don't know if you um, addressed this, Wendy, but I feel like, a lot of the farriers in our area don't look for landing patterns at all. And they'll, um, they shoot for a pretty foot and they'll balance, you know, and put a lot of, they put a lot of gear in the back of the foot, but they don't actually make the foot land heel first. So I think we end up with this problem a lot in our big show barns because the feet look pretty, but they're not as functional as they should be. Yeah, and as the, as we see the horse, past us that toe first landing is so obvious because you can see it come down and the rest of the foot's not on the ground yet right yeah yeah so um you know i really like to try to change that i use a lot of frog pads to start to give that frog some stimulation you know improve the health of the back of the foot and see what we can do to um start to get some more motion this horse had some pretty bad um thrush you know, around his frogs and they were kind of atrophied. So we're trying to treat that as well. Yeah. Okay. Cool. What am I doing? Did I do something weird? My screen is paused. Hold on, let me see I'm sure. Okay. Ah. <laughs> okay. All right, so we don't need to see that anymore. Okay, so this is a slide about um, tooth motion. So um, can you guys see the difference? This is before and after you see this plant on this horse. Again, just trying to make sure that your eye is seeing it. Yep. So this is what they did to correct it. 
So this one's pretty significant where I think it would be hard to correct it completely. Um, but they've done a pretty good job of getting this really nice and even so the horse has slide. So um, this is a video from Michigan and it's, um, it's a really great video of the motion of chewing. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone else explain it this way. So I'm just gonna play this and um, you guys can tell me what you think afterwards. We're just doing a section of it that starts at like six minutes. Okay, we're, we're back to your editor editing version of your PowerPoint. Okay, so I think I have to do a new share. Yeah, probably. It Zoom does not follow the screen changes very well. Yeah, there we go. Okay, okay so you, can you see this mastication anatomy? Yep. All right. Can you make so it full gonna, screen? Yep, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. So that's full screen. There we go. All right, so you guys have full screen? Yep, give it a sec, because there we go. Okay. The specialized shapes and angles of the teeth. The chewing cycle is divided into three phases or strokes. Opening, closing, and power. During the opening stroke, the mandible opens and moves laterally and rostrally to position the molar arcade for grinding food. So it's lateral and forward. During the closing stroke, the mandible moves dorsally and medially, and the molars initiate contact. During the power stroke, the jaw moves immediately while continuously maintaining molar contact. This phase begins at the point of initial molar contact and then travels across the mouth through the neutral position and ends with cheek teeth contact being made on the contralateral side of the mouth. The mandible then returns to the neutral position or the cycle repeats. That's a really cool video. Isn't that neat? I just, I just, I, nobody else has ever broken it down for me. So um, I just, I love this. So um, it, it's from Michigan State. It, it's, anybody can get there. You just go to Michigan State University and look up their videos. They have a whole bunch of stuff on teeth and chewing. Um, they have a couple guys that were big into getting um, equine dentists certified that do a whole bunch of classes for their vet school. So they have all kinds of great stuff. Um, but I think that just kind of shows you guys you know, what's actually going on. All right, so then I have to just do, do you a have new horses share again. that chew right and horses that like, when, so he talks about the jaw opening and the mandible sliding. Do you have some that always slide right while some slide left? Yeah, so that's what I would call like a bodywork restriction is the ones that only chew on one side. So what they're supposed to do, and I think they talk about this in this video later, is they're supposed to do like 10 swipes on the right and then swift switch and then do 10 swipes on the left, you know, so that they're doing this little figure eight motion. And if they're not doing that, they're only chewing on one side. What you'll find is that they'll end up with one arcade that'll look really slanted and one that'll be really flat because they're only doing one side and it's that upstroke at the end that is what creates all of our points. You know, so that's where all of the pathology comes from that we see. Okay, so then I have to go back so, so would it be fair to say that somebody could video their horse chewing and then look at it in slow motion or film it in slow motion and figure out which way, if the horse has a preference? I think they could totally do that. Yeah. Like if you were to sit, sit and watch them and just see, you'll find a lot of horses that will only chew on one side. Yeah. You know, and. And then I think what is really cool is to start looking at that and then look at their front teeth and look at their front feet, you know, and think about where they have problems in their body, you know, and I think you can come up with all kinds of interesting correlations. So like, like I said, when we were doing the lameness locator thing, you know, the two of us thought we were, we really wanted to see what the combination was going to be between high, low feet in the front and the jaw. That's what we were really excited about. And what we're finding is that the majority of the lameness that it's picking up is hind end, not front end. Wow. So Yeah. So even though the horse has, you know, a planted jaw and a high low conformation in front, they're coming up as being sound in front and having a hind limb lameness which I thought was really not at all what it's I really expected. Really interesting. <laughs> you know, it just means I have to think long and hard about it. I was going to say, that's going <laughs> to be awake at night, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to. <laughs> you know. Okay, so let me um, go back to PowerPoint. So I'm going to stop this and then we'll do, we'll go back to this one. 
Okay, so, you know, just like we were just talking about, which way would you guys think, does anyone want to guess, which way do you think this lower jaw moves? Does it move to the horse's right, which would be over here, or do you think it moves to the horse's left? Okay, somebody pop in the guess? chat, which way do you think it's going? That we have, nobody's brave. <laughs> nobody's brave. That's okay. Right. Somebody so, said right. It's going to be the horse's right. So this lower jaw is going to go this direction over here, right? The upper jaw is going this way. So by just by improving the slant, you're going to allow the horse to start thinking about it. Um, and then the other thing you need to do is make sure that the molars are even so that the horse has the ability to do the same thing, doesn't have a slant in the back. So the case we'll look at at the end actually has uneven molars, just so you can see the difference. Um, yeah, so, you know, guesses on possible, you know, lameness issues. I think that, um, let's see, so they're going to have an upright foot and they're going to have a low foot in front. So the upright foot is usually the foot that might have started a problem, right? Because an upright foot can be an indication of lameness. If you ever have a horse that's been chronically lame for a while, sometimes that leg will end up with kind of a smaller foot that's more upright because they're not bearing weight on it. And then the other foot will get really wide and spread out and kind of low because it's taking all of the weight. So I think you can maybe make some assumptions there. And like I said, I, I really think what we're gonna find is it's all coming back to the hind end in, in a way that I was totally not expecting. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so, that's really so um, from an osteopathic standpoint, we talk about the temporal mandibular joint having a direct um, effect on the motion of the pelvis, on the wing of the pelvis. So those two seem to correlate. And then we talk about the, the junction between the pole and the first vertebrae having a direct connection to the motion of the sacroiliac lumbosacral joints in motion. You know, so midline affects midline and the outside affects the outside of the body. So that may be what we're seeing here is some sort of connection with that. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, it is. And I'm just wondering, you know, since the shoulders aren't attached by any bone, maybe the front legs can accommodate, but it's going through the spine and all the way back to the hindquarters, which is connected and can't. Yeah, no. I think that would make a lot of sense that there is a, probably a much more direct connection to the hind end than the front end, because that front end is allowed to have some elasticity. Right. You know, compensation patterns. I think that's probably very true. Yeah. And um, I, I do a couple of stretches on um, horses in the high den where I work on the psoas. And I always feel like it, I get a like a hyoid release, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the inside of the tongue, basically the base of the tongue and connects into the team today right. just by releasing the psoas. So, you know, we're going to, we'll look at some fascial connections and why that happens. But I think that's a key part part of it. So just to review for you guys who aren't anatomy buffs, then let's just kind of go over what parts affect the TMJ motion, right? So um, on this picture on the left, you're going to see the two muscles that are really important for closing the jaw. So we all see this big cheek muscle all the time. That's the masseter muscle. And another one that's really important is this dark red one. That's the temporalis muscle. So those are both important for closing motion, right, in the jaw. And they're on the outside of the mandible. Um, and then on the inside of the mandible, if you guys look on the far right, this picture is a little hard to interpret because they didn't really tell you, you know, that these muscles are on the inside of the mandible, right? So there, there's something you aren't going to see unless you were to cut off the mandible and look on the inside. So these pterygoid muscles are really important for bringing that jaw across for that, you know, that sort of power stroke that we saw in the video. These are what are going to really help with that. You know, they're going to be important in the rotation. And then this digastricus muscle, this green one, that's the one that opens the jaw. And it actually has a couple heads that come way under here, you know, and sit kind of right underneath the, the tongue itself. You know, so they can definitely affect some things. Um, just another thing that a lot of people don't realize, you know, because we see a lot of pictures of things that are just from the side, right? So we just go, oh, look at this little TMJ joint right here. But you have to think about it as this whole thing right here is the TMJ joint. It's not just the little 
tiny piece here. And it's actually figure eight shaped. So you can see this a little better on the one that's the left side. There's a circle here, and then there's a circle on the other side. Take a look at that. So that's because there are two TMJ joints and they're gonna be two different angles, right? Cause you're gonna have the angle that the teeth are affecting on one side and then the other that, that you know, coming down and then the power stroke. Um, so you can often find problems that are very hard to, to diagnose because there's no way to really visualize them. So when we, um, when a veterinarian goes to maybe look at the TMJ joint, they can ultrasound the outer part of it, right? There's a disc that sits on here so they can look at the outer edge of it. But this part on the inside, you can't really see. And even if you try to x-ray it, this part is almost impossible to capture on an x-ray because it gets superimposed by teeth and mandible and it's really hard to see. So the only way you can really ever know if you truly had like um, sort of arthritis or you know, an OCD lesion or something that was on this inside edge would be to do an MRI or a CT scan. So if you happen to have extra money hanging around and you, know, you just wanna send your horse in for a CT or an MRI, you could do that. Most of us don't do that. Right. Um, I had one client that actually did it this year and it was really interesting because we had you know, constant right TMJ issues and I really felt like that was the problem but I couldn't, I couldn't diagnose it. And she did a CT and the veterinarian that did the CT came back and said, yes, there's mild degenerative changes, you know, but they, they aren't looking at these all the time for mild problems. So it was enough to me that they found something there that I felt like it was significant and we injected the joint and the horse was doing a lot better. Mm. So, you know, it was really interesting. Proof in the pudding. Yeah. So um, just to remind you of all the anatomy, right? So we're just talking about it. Um, you know, this is the next part of that is, and um, we have this little free cartilaginous, cartilaginous structure called the hyoid. That's gonna kind of sit right here, like right in the throat lash area underneath the mandible and then right behind it. And what this does is the very front of it attaches into the tongue. You know, so if you have restrictions in the hyoid, it can certainly affect tongue, tongue motion or if somebody has changed the tongue motion of the horse for some reason, it can affect the hyoid, vice versa, right? And then these two big pieces, you can see them up here, they're going to come up and attach into the side of the temporomandibular joint, right? So a pull on the tongue or a pull on these soft tissue structures, you know, in the chest might create a strain as this comes up and connects in right here. And there are a lot of really important, you know, autonomic nervous system structures in this area, as well as blood flow. So this big vein is the carotid artery, um, but you also have the vagus um, nerve right here. You're going to have jugular vein, you know, it's all coming right through here. It comes in, exits the skull right behind where this hyoid is coming in. So if you were to have a restriction that was pulling all of these soft tissues kind of up and making this area congested or tight, you can certainly affect, you know, the input of the vagus nerve to the body, which is your whole GI tract, lungs, heart, anything that is visceral, any organs are all affected by a vagus nerve problem. You know, and you could certainly affect blood flow, whether that's, you're not getting correct perfusion to the brain, or you're not getting drainage from the brain, you know, you can affect that too. So this one, again, just to kind of help you guys figure out where that is. So this, this little structure that's kind of triangular shaped on the top here is the epiglottis. That's what closes the trachea when you swallow. And that's what they're trying to draw right here. So, you know, this same structure is right in here. And then if you look, this is all those blood vessels and nerves you know, they exit right behind the TMJ or right underneath it, and then they're coming down into this area. So does anyone have any questions so far about anatomy? Are we good? Yeah, I, I, I went down and did the Sharon May Davis dissection the end of February, and um, so we got to actually look at all these structures in a, in a real horse. It was, it's so amazing when the more you understand this creature, the more you're amazed that he can do what he does, right? I mean, that's the... Yeah, it's just, it is. It really is. So, and then just kind of a review if we're talking about hyoid, right? Now we have these 
muscles that are called the sternohyoid and the sternothyrohyoid. This should be the sternothyrohyoid. So those two both are coming out of those same structures that we were talking about. And they're attaching directly into this first and second rib and the sternum, right? So if you have a restriction in mobility in the chest, or you know, maybe there's a shift in balance from one side to the other, this is like where your pads come in, right? Because this would yeah. be a really great way to loosen up the balance here, you know, is using the pads, then that could directly affect the hyoid and the TMJ. And then there's another really important muscle, I think, that we need to really focus on horses more than in people. So we're going to look at fascial trains in people. And they talk a lot about, you know, the trapezius as being a key player in this shoulder connection. Um, I think that the brachiocephalicus is a bigger deal in the horses than the trapezius, because that trapezius in horses is pretty small. You know, I, I think they're getting a lot of their pull from this muscle instead of from, you know, up here. Um, so you have to think this is coming in, it's gonna, you're gonna see another picture here where it comes in and connects in, in to the forelimb and then it's gonna have some play on the rest of the body. So um, you gotta love Jillian's stuff. She does a really good job. She paints better than anyone I've ever known on horses. <laughs> it's really nice to see how she does all that. Um, you know, just to review what we were talking about with angles on the feet, right? So. If you have a horse that's got a negative palmar angle like this and is already starting to get, you know, some bony changes in the back of the foot, that's going to affect how they land. It's going to affect how they move. And I certainly think it would affect the restrictions in the jaw. So if you have a horse like this, you should be looking at dentistry and you should be looking at body work to help them figure out how to get through it. That's kind of your take home. So again, we have all of these connections here. So we always talk about a dorsal fascial chain, right? Kind of coming across, you know, the nuchal ligament and the latissimus, which I'll show you all of these long back muscles and the gluteal muscles and down the spine, right? So that's the one we want to have allowing us to flex the back. And then we have this whole ventral line, which includes the hyoid. So they've drawn the connection into the TMJ and the tongue, you know, all these muscles going into the sternum and then down the belly wall and connecting in. I, I like to think of these, you know, maybe even connecting into the front of the leg a little on the back. So this is what some of these fascial connections look like in people, right? So they have one that comes straight down the back all the way to the bottom of your toes. And we have this other one that's coming from right next to your TMJ, right across the front, and then it comes through the quadriceps and down the front of your toes. So, you know, when we think about that, that back line on, you know, people or on horses, it, you have to kind of imagine it comes down here. It's going to include the tail and come down the back here. So I think if there's a problem within the structures in this line, you're going to see a problem that goes from one side of the front of the body to one side of the back of the body. It's not going to cross, right? This is not a crossing fascial connection. This would be a same-sided fascial connection. So something up here could be affecting something, you know, somewhere along here, you know, maybe even the hawk, you know, something like that. So when you start looking at how, you know, we get into connections with the front line, you know, it's hard because you have to interpret this and how it's connected from humans to horses. So if you look at, you have to kind of imagine this. So we have these structures of the, the back of the pole coming down, crossing over the shoulder. And then these structures on the human would connect with the extensor ligaments on the front of the foot, you know, on the front of the leg. So, you know, going down to the toe of the foot. So we, we can say that a problem that would affect these lines in the back could affect the tension at the toe, right? Where is a problem on the front, you know, here in the pectoral muscles would then affect the back side of the hoof. So your flexor tendons, navicular bursa, you know, any sort of thing there could be affected by a restriction that's affecting the inside of the chest. So then, you know, we were talking about trapezius. This is what they kind of correlate with this trapezius on people. It's huge. You know, it's really coming down and having a, a pretty profound impact on this, the edge of the shoulder. 
I just don't think it does that much in horses. You know, so I think you have to really look at brachiospelicus. And you have to also think that everything crosses. So it's not always one-sided because some of these patterns cross the body. So this is what I was kind of talking about. You have this brachiocephalicus muscle coming down, but can you see how it interweaves with the latissimus dorsi and the extensor carpal, um, radial carpal extensor muscle? And the, there's a big fibrous band called the Lacertus fibrosis that's connecting into that. So we have this web between the back end, you know, and the shoulder, really not the shoulder, the, the thoracic spine, and then up here, and this attached is in on the first vertebrae. So it's not going to be a direct attachment to the TMJ. But um, as I was talking about, you always find a pattern in the neck that you can associate with the TMJ. So you could walk it down. This is just another um, visual of this um, latissimus dorsi. So you guys can see how dense that uh, fascia is. It's kind of holding it in place. So then we have all these ventral connections, right? Where we were talking about, you have TMJ and hyoid and all those sternohyoid and um, sternothyroid muscles coming down and attaching into the sternum. And then you have those connections like we just saw with the extensors of the forelimb. And then it comes down through the muscles of the abdomen and has the same effect on the extensors and the quadriceps on the hind limb. So that's another connection you can find. So this is the one I want to talk about next time, you know, just kind of looking at it kind of quickly. This is the one that I deal with a lot, which is the visceral and internal muscle connections. So what we're seeing is a connection between that hyoid and then those little tiny muscles around the hyoid and the ones that are really deep connect into the thoracic inlet. And then they connect through the diaphragm and the psoas to the inside of the pelvis right through here. So I think that this one gets missed a lot and is a big problem for horses. Um, Wendy, you might be able to weigh in on this because I think these are the postural muscles, right? They, a lot of people use these for posture. And yeah. what I see is that horses that get tired go to these muscles because nothing else is working anymore. You know, so then I think if they get really tired and then overworked, then they start using these muscles as locomotion instead of as posture. And so then we end up with all these restrictions in here. I think that's a lot more common than um, people realize. That, it makes a lot of sense, you know, because as soon as you start fatiguing, you're going to start compensating and try to recruit somebody else, even if it's right. not their job, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, so I think that's what happens. And, you know, I always kind of imagine that little two or three year old that, you know, hasn't done anything. And now all of a sudden he's got his 30 days of training and he's supposed to be cantering at the end of it. Right. You know, a lot of those horses go from not having any muscle to being asked to do a lot very quickly without having the time to build the proper muscling for it. So I think they tend to use these to do their job because they don't have any others. So, so that said, how long does it take to, to, uh, uh in terms of developing a muscle, right? When you think about your large locomotor muscles, how long does it take to develop muscles that are really strong enough to be able to do the job of carrying weight before you put a rider on? I like nobody ever wants me to say this, but I think it's one to two years. I don't think it's as fast as we like to do it. You know, and I think it's uh, that's the hard part. I don't, but that's what I've seen is it really does take time to get those muscles to the point where they can do their job. Right. And, and, we and that they fatigue quit, you know, when because I, I always look at, you know, when I see people on these young horses sitting on them for long periods of time, you're fatiguing the muscles that you want to be carrying, and then they're going to have to go into other muscles to try and deal with the job. And now you're affecting things that shouldn't be influenced. In other words, you know, if you're going to be on your young horse for an hour, what, how is he going to develop the be able to hold that strength for an hour under the rider's weight as a two year or three year or four year, you know, even a four year old. Yeah, so I think it's really hard. And, and what I find out a lot of times is, and I'll, I'll move it to a horse, you know, so this is that psoas muscle um, that, you know, we, we need to think about it. It connects in from the hip to the tuber coxae and into the spine. 
Um, and I think this is what does a lot of propulsion for horses that don't have gluteal muscles. But what it will do in the process is when it when the leg is off the ground, it's going to pull the leg up. But because it's working so hard, it gets shortened by work. So that means that when they're standing in place, then this starts to come down. So they end up with their spine sort of extended and their butt out behind them. If you kind of visualize a woman in high heels and how they kind of look uh -huh. walking around in high heels. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but that and makes so this, much more sense that they're, it's when it shortens that they're going to actually go into extension in their back as opposed to thinking when it shortens, they're going to wind up in flexion because the leg is the thing on the ground and the thing that's movable is going to move toward the thing that's standing. Right, exactly. So, you know, then everybody worries about hunters bumps and all this other stuff. But I think a lot of it starts because this, these muscles are getting shortened and they're unable to relax enough to let this part of the back come up. So in, in general, when I do my adjustments, I usually adjust and release the psoas and come back. And the majority of the time I might have like one vertebrae to adjust. Everything else is gone just by releasing the psoas. So I think it's a lot more important than we know. Yeah. So this is kind of like my drawing of what those internal lines would look like on a horse, right? So you have something coming from the hyoid and it's going to come in, you know, these muscles that are on the inside of the neck here and come down along with the esophagus, which is in this area too. And they're all going to come through the diaphragm. Like the esophagus dives through the diaphragm and these muscles are coming through and then thoracic inlet kind of across. So this is diaphragm and the diaphragm goes kind of from here all the way up and attaches into the lumbar spine and the thoracolumbar junction as the psoas is going the opposite way. And um, if you just did a dissection, I don't know if you got to see this, but you can literally see their like fingers, you know, going through each other as they attach on the back. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. So you yeah, know, it's not, you know, and this is, you know, it's so hard from drawings because we think, okay, this muscle ends here and this muscle starts here, but it's nothing like what it is in the system, right? Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> work like that. You can, you do, you see them go between each other and attach. It's just so amazing. So, I mean, a problem way up here will, uh, can affect, you know, this whole area and then affect how that psoas moves, right? So, um, you know, if you had a horse that, let's say you had a horse that was put in a pessoa or draw reins or something for a long period of time. And, you know, maybe they had a lot of strain on this part of their neck, you know, from being held into a position like that, that could then create strain that would create strain on the diaphragm and the psoas. So it can go from front to back and it go, can go from back to front, yep. you know, and this is how we see it. Okay. So wrapping it all up together, we'll do this second case. Um, so this is a little pony. He's a 17 year old pony gilding. He's super cute. He's a little paint pony. Um, and, and you know, same thing. We're just trying to, you know, help him out. He has some pull issues. He has some problems with, um, picking up his canner. That's another thing you'll sometimes see. So just trying to see if we can help him out. So if you guys can see that there's a, can you guys, can, is there anyone who can't see the slant? Your here? pointer really like, helps. Yeah. Okay. So just that's the slant. So this side is high and this side is high, right? So the lower, his lower left, our lower right and the upper, his upper right. So that means that he can't really get his lower jaw over here. So it's, his lower jaw is staying on his left side. Okay. Yep. So imagine that same slant, right? So we're going to be going, the slant goes this way. And you can see the same thing here. Do you see how this side is shorter in length yeah. than this side? So that to me, when you start to see the slant of the incisors in the whole molar arcade, that means this has been there for a long time, right? Because nobody has changed it. Um, and then even if you were to straighten this up, if you didn't fix the imbalance here, he would have a slant again next year. So it's just one more way to think about this, that we're perpetuating the imbalance with the teeth. Um, I don't, yeah, I, don't, I think it's very, unless they have some sort of pathology in their mouth, and I don't think the problem starts with the teeth. I think the teeth are an indicator that something is going, going on for a while. And and then at some point, they might be the balance point that doesn't change and keeps them in that imbalance. 
Right. right. So I don't think that you, you should say, you know, oh, you made my horse lame because you didn't fix his teeth. It's just more that we need to be aware of it so we can help them to improve and get better. Right. You know, because this is this is telling you there's already you you can just use this as an indicator that there's definitely something else going on. Right. Um, so his right front is more upright than the left. So we can see that here. Did the, so are his feet at two different sizes too? I mean, they look kind of like they were different sizes. It's so hard to tell when you do foot films, right? Or foot pictures, because you're always on one side or the other. Yeah. You know? So I, I feel like it's really hard to say, but he, I, I can know that he was more upright on the right than the left. Okay. Yeah, but he could very well, right? So the upright one is usually a little smaller and the flat one is usually a little wider. Okay. And so then that's just kind of just going through what we found. So right TMJ problem, right? To the point where he had muscle atrophy. So this has definitely been there for a long time. And then, you know, the upright right front, kind of low heel, long toe on the left, and then a restriction in the right pelvis and lumbar spine and the psoas in the left SI. So um, it showed up when we did the lameness locator as a right hind lameness. Ah. And there was a little bit where he wasn't really landing on the right front. So maybe kind of landing on the left front a little more. Yep. But I think that's all that right hind. So um, I just, because it's hard to kind of visualize it all. So I've tried to kind of draw <laughs> what that looks like. So for this case, right, in a problem up here. So then I can walk down the spine and these are like where I'll usually find things. So it'll, the immobilities will rock back and forth up here at C1, C2, C3, and again, kind of down at the, the bottom of the spine. So I have a problem at the right TMJ, problem at the right shoulder. And then I usually see something with the rib cage on the opposite side, like in the girth area, you know, cause they're having to compensate for this balance that's pulling them to the right. So they end up with a strain on the left. And, and when, it, I think when it starts at the, TMJ in the pole, like we were talking about, it all ends up kind of on the same side. You'll find some restrictions in this whole lumbar spine, you know, because of the psoas. So the psoas is coming up and attaching in here and that will be restricted. And then the sacrum on the opposite side. So that's that's what I would, I would say this horse had. And this is more of like your typical, you know, horse that doesn't have anything real obvious. It's just like a typical compensation pattern that almost all of us walk around with, you yeah. know, that isn't creating a lot of performance issues. You're not really noticing any lameness. Usually you'll end up with restrictions in the shoulder and the TMJ on one side, and then it will swap and it'll be the lumbar on the other. So I think this is more of like your typical, you know, I'm just been using myself more on the right versus the left and, you know, this may change or they may have just like us be more right-handed than left-handed and they'll have a pattern that will swap like this. But I think when you see them more where it's all on one side, um, these are the ones that are having more performance problems. You know, it's a harder time for them to canter. Or they're having a harder time you know, doing something. So that's usually what I'm looking for is what kind yeah, of there is no. Have. There is no perfectly straight body in any any organism anywhere on the planet. No, right. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, people always do this to us. They say, you know, can you have Dr. Hancock come out and only adjust my horse if she finds something? And we're like, she's going to find something. Find something. You know, <laughs> like there's always something, <laughs> no matter what. Yeah, because we're know, but life, it, you know, right? Yeah. Right. We all have stuff. So, but I think if the, if a horse has a pattern where everything is tight on the same side, these are the ones that people say, I can't get him to bend. You know, he's not picking up the canner. You know, um, he's really tight in the bridle. You know, I think you hear more of that sort of thing when it's all on one side than when they have that normal pattern. It's just that you have a strong side and a weak side. Right. So I'm just kind of trying to make that clear that, you know, that's what we find. So, and this is the, I have to, yes. Okay, the sound's off, good. So this one, I think if we start like here, this, this is that pony moving. Just so you guys can see. We should have taken his blanket off, sorry. It's a little dirty <laughs> and that's the downside of Zoom is that it the videos, um, if you let it play through and then just grab your your slider and, and slide it, sometimes that works better. Okay. 
Yeah, well, if there's a clear toe first landing there on the, I think it's the left front, and then we've got our right front. So what I find really interesting with this horse is that you see this toe, you see this toe first landing the whole way up the hill. So he, he seems like he's having a really hard time landing heel first and, and he turns around and goes down the hill and he has a heel first landing. It's the craziest thing. So yeah. I wonder if, you know, for him, if this is more of something up higher, you know, where he doesn't, he's, he isn't able to get his shoulder up and out of the way as well, because he doesn't have any problem when you would think if it was his feet that hurt, he wouldn't want to do it when he turns around and goes the other way. Yeah, we haven't seen him go downhill yet. I'm trying to see if I can. Well, he's seen him go know, when it's in slow motion, it takes forever. Yeah, now we're going downhill. Well, and Zoom, Zoom just does weird things to videos. It's unfortunate, but it does. Yeah, so if you guys watch there, he certainly is willing to come down and, you know, you know, he's willing to land heel first. You guys, I don't know if you can yeah, see that. Yeah, yeah, we right can there. see that. It's really fascinating, actually, because it's such a different look from the uphill direction. Right? You know, the speed didn't change or anything. So I think for him, it, it probably is something more like maybe chest or withers that's creating part of the problem. But this is really interesting because it tells us that we, if we're going to do slow-mo videos of our horses, we should look at them on flat, uphill, and downhill. <laughs> no, right? Not just on the flat. Yeah, <laughs> no. You learn something from everything you do. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was that. So we have to go through that. I think that's my last slide. So does anyone have any questions? On yes, we have. We have a bunch of questions. If you unshare your screen, then we can go live. Okay, go back I to will that. do that. Um, so, no, I think it's really fascinating. One of the things I love about your, your webinar is that we've touched on, like we, I've had Jillian Primebring talk about hyoid and different people talk about fashion. We've looked at bones, but what's so nice about this is it's putting it all together into a practical idea of this is your horse. And if you're having this problem, make sure you check this because it can, here are the places that you can see it. Cause we've had a lot of, a lot of the different parts, but this is right. like kind of a really nice cohesive. So, so somebody's asking, in terms of minutes, how long would a young horse take to fatigue? 10 to 15 minutes? And I think- I, that's Yeah, I, I think at first, yeah. You know, um, 10, 15 minutes. I mean, so I always think about it as when I go to do yoga and someone gives me one of those TheraBands and I have to go do, you know, an exercise with them. I'm tired after 10, 15 reps. You know, my muscles are fatigued. So- if you think about it that way, I think that we need to understand that they don't have the muscle to hold it for long periods of time. And it is important that they get lots of breaks and, you know, they're standing still, or like you were saying earlier, they can't hold you for an hour, just sitting up there and then expect them to go off and do something. So, you know, maybe you do something for five or 10 minutes and then hop off and let them graze or let them sit because they're babies and they need to sit and then, you know, get back on and do something else. Um, but yeah, I don't think they're strong enough for an hour for yeah, a while. You know, I, I have a really good friend who's a rainer in Richmond. He's retired now, but he would only ride his babies 10 to 15 minutes. That was max. And then mm -hmm. he would just let him watch the other horses and he'd work a bunch of horses, but, and all of his horses, and he never did any tricks, never until he could rate them on a huge box, huge rectangle. So, you know, I, I think people want to get to the fancy stuff a little too fast with a lot of these horses. And so with, when they're not ready and his horses were beautifully muscled. Okay. What is the frequency of work during that, these one to two years? Um, well, I think if you were working, you, they need a couple of days off, right? So, you know, between three and five days a week, you know, they're young and they need time to just be babies you know be silly and learn things in the field you know you need to change it up um don't be afraid of lateral work or groundwork you know or doing a like doing a pastoral session like you can you can do different things every, every day you know take them for a walk in the woods and um, i've had a couple people that do that with their babies they actually take them on walks like yeah. they'll, they'll just walk their horses into the woods and go on a, it's a pedestrian trail ride. But I think that's a really good way to build muscle and teach them proprioception, get them lifting their feet over interesting, you know, terrains and they have to balance. And then you're not putting them there and expecting them to hold you too. Yeah. So that's and a good someone, way to do it too. Someone's asking if you can train with light weights, such as like 20 pounds versus the weight of a rider. Sure. 
Yeah, absolutely. Because you'd have to make sure it's stable. The hard part is yeah. figuring out how to. <laughs> no, that would be bad if it's flopping all over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's much harder to deal with a movable weight than a stable weight, right? Like a horse that's yeah. packing something. Uh, in handwork and having them reach out and down helps build back muscle. I guess that's a st statement or a question. Not sure. Um, so, yes, absolutely. So um, the best ways to build back muscle is walking um, to start. So you get the most motion in the spine at the walk. The spine doesn't move a whole lot at the trot. So for me, trotting is your cardiovascular gait. So you use it to build fitness. And then canter is actually a really good way to start to strengthen um, the lumbar spine and the gluteal muscles. It really is influenced because it has to, everything has to flex. So um, not necessarily um, do you want them to hold the canter for a long time, but maybe just doing a canter to part two, three steps and then walk to start because you want to just do it to the point of tired and stop. So that's why you need to just do short periods instead of, you know, loping for 20 minutes, then you've completely missed the whole point of it. So it's just short little canter departs and trots and, or, and then lots of walking and adding in the lateral work to start to mobilize the spine. And that's what I do. I think it helps a lot. I think we really need to have a evolution and understanding of muscle training and fitness training in horses so that we avoid a lot of the injuries later on. And, you know, I don't think people think about conditioning tendons, which uh, that's a whole other story. We won't go there right now. Okay. I could see that. on your <laughs> I know. But maybe no, we'll have exactly. you back for a talk about conditioning. We can do that. <laughs> okay. So precisely what work would be, would the horse be doing during those one to two years uh, of strengthening to carry a rider? I, mean, I think you just answered that. It's a lot of cross training, yeah. hand walking, turnout, hills, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Um, yeah, getting them to move around in hills, you know, just teaching them the basics of, you know, how do I move my shoulder? What, what means to move my shoulder? What means to move my haunches? What means back up? What means forward? You know, you could hop on and just ask them to lower their head a couple of times and then hop back off. You know, when you're yep. first starting, you're just real basic stuff. So they start to learn it. And that's where things like, you know, walking over poles, doing uh, mm -hmm. like with the Tellington work, the labyrinth and all those things to develop hoof eye coordination. I mean, yep. there, there's so many things we can do with our horses with a little imagination, right? Yeah. Sure foot pads you know, help strengthen a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because we have some people that are using the pads before they ever start the horses under saddle and they're so much more balanced, which makes sense, right? Because they have figured out their balance. Okay. Uh, what would you, uh, we, were you able to resolve some of, I guess the ponies restrictions, because this is pretty late in the talk. Were you able to resolve those pony, those restrictions yep. in that? Pony? Yep. Uh, yep. What, a, what about getting them back in shape after an injury? Also 10 to 15 minutes, how long? And Right. So I think um, the big thing again is lots and lots of walking, you know, and making sure that they are mobile. So what happens a lot of times with injuries, like we were talking about with that horse that had the suspensory injury at the beginning is, you know, they start to favor something. So then they start to overuse the other side. So I think it's important that we then take the time to mobilize them afterwards and teach them they have to move symmetrically again because um, they might not have any pain anymore but have trained themselves to move in an asymmetrical pattern. So that's what's really important with the retraining where the walking comes in is that you can very purposely start to train them to move symmetrically. Um, on and it's the same thing in people. I mean, I, I, as a Feldenkrais practitioner, I can't tell you how many times I'll watch somebody and I'll go, you know, uh, uh, do you know you're limping? And they're like, I'm what? No, I don't notice it at all. And then you say, well, yeah, I blew out my knee, you know, like two years ago and had surgery. And, you know, and unless we retrain the nervous system back to more balanced function, it's going to hang on to the habits. Horse or human. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So I think that's the important part with the PT after an injury is retraining the balance of the body. Yeah. Yep. And, and the beauty is we're coming up with more and more ways to do that. And I think, um, you know, like I was over at Nova Equestrians, their new fitness center and that sort of thing. And we're starting to realize we have to put more emphasis on good balance and fitness. So we're not winding up in the rehab situations. Um, right. So that's where what you do is so valuable because you can assess the horse and hope to avoid those injuries by catching these things, especially, you know, like the balance of the jaw. Anybody who's ever had TMJ stuff, as a human being, 
Yeah, I know. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Really important. But yeah, okay. I just go ahead. Go ahead. Last question. Uh, my horse has regularly stood with her left hind foot forward of the right hind. I've noticed in the last year that her hoof appears longer at the toe and shorter at the heel. My farrier hasn't been concerned when I point that out, and I wonder if I'm looking at it properly. She doesn't appear in pain, but we've had challenges from our prior riding. Please explain what side of the jaw could correlate if there is a correlation. Okay, so she holds her, you said the left front in front of the right front. Uh, left hind foot, or left hind, in front right of, hind, left, left hind, hind foot in front of right hind. hind, and it's changing. Okay, so what we probably have is a restriction. So that's usually a restriction in the left SI and then the right lumbar. So you might have a psoas restriction on the right, and then the right girth area, and then it might it'll depend. A little bit on whether it's jaw related or coming from the hind end and what it does in the front end, right? So um, if there's a restriction that stays on the same side, um, which would be going at the right shoulder and right TMJ, then it might be coming from the jaw. Whereas if it swaps and goes to the left side, it could be a balance issue, you know, something like that. So it's hard to say for sure, but I would definitely look at the teeth. And if you see something there, address it. Um, one thing you could do that's really easy to help stretch psoas muscles is to pick up the hind limb, kind of like you would to pick out a foot. You know, said that you're holding the, you know, you're standing up and the hoof is kind of where you're looking at the sole and it's a little behind the horse. And then what I do is I rock it from inside to outside and ask them to stretch their leg back and just kind of pull the leg back really slowly while rocking it inside to outside. And that's a really good way to stretch the psoas. I should probably put a video of that up somewhere. We would love to have you come back and talk about that, okay? Yeah, yeah. Like, so, I mean, there's some great ways to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Get some video and come back and we'll talk about, uh, we could have you for many webinars, I can see. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, some things that the horse owners can do to, you know, release this, the psoas a little bit or look at the jaw, you know, all these things, because, um, you know, I, what you've just described and my thought with that woman is go photograph your horse's teeth. And I bet there's going to be something there. Right. It would be right. really interesting to see. Yeah. Maybe when, <laughs> when you come back, we can ever come back and send us some photos and we can take a look. Um, but that's the thing is, uh, if we can't observe it, it doesn't exist. So the first thing is we have to be able to observe it. But then the question is, is there something that, that yes, we need assistance, but if there's only assistance and then there's two months where nobody does anything to help the horse continue, you know, you're, you're losing. And yeah, I'm sure that you have a hard time getting all of your clients to do what they're supposed to do every day to keep the horse going for the next time you come back and then you can keep moving forward. Right. Um, I mean, it's amazing how the ones that do their homework barely need to see me. Right. You know, and the ones that don't, I'm always out there again, fixing the same problem. Right. So maybe it's what to do as homework. We can do a webinar. So. <laughs> there you go. That'd awesome. All right. So we will be in touch to bring you back for another webinar. And um, people have really enjoyed this. Looking forward to it. Um, thank you all for joining us. It's been a pleasure. We're back on webinars again. And now I have a guest that's near, not only nearby, but awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's great. And this will get posted, as you all know, on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. And, you know, we had some glitches, but looks like a lot of people made it. And of course, you can always watch the recording. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you tomorrow night, eight o'clock at night with Ida Hammer talking about changes in hoof, hooves as we come into spring. So we know feet change, right? And we're going to look at what are some of the things that are going to change and what you need to be aware of as that happens. So thank you so much, Emery. It's a pleasure to mm -hmm. meet you. I'm really glad to, that we've had this chat. Yep, absolutely. Go take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.